Chapter 3 It was morning. The cold duke gazed out of a window in the castle as if he were watching flowers in bloom or flying birds. He was watching his varlets feeding whisper to the geese. He turned away and took three limps and stared at the minstrel, staring in the, standing in the great hall of the castle, both hands bound behind him. What manner of prince is this you speak of, and what manner of maiden does he love, to use a word that makes no sense and has no point? His voice sounded like iron dropped on velvet. A noble prince, a noble lady, the minstrel said. When they are wed, a million people will be glad. The duke took his sword out of his sword cane and stared at it. He limped across and faced his captive and touched his guggle softly with the point and touched his zatch and sighed and frowned and put the sword away. We shall think of some amusing task for you to do, he said. I do not like your tricks and guile. I think there is no prince or maiden who would wed if I should slay you, but I am neither sure nor certain. He grinned and said again, We'll think of some amusing task for you to do. But I'm not a prince, the minstrel said, and only princes may aspire to Saralinda's hand. The cold duke kept on grinning. Why then, we'll make a prince of you, he said, the prince of rags and jingles. He clapped his... Well, hello, Danya. Cat always likes to be involved in reading. He clapped his gloves together, and two varlets appeared without a word or sound. Take him to the dungeon, said the duke. Feed him water without bread, and bread without water. The varlets were taking the minstrel out of the great hall, when down the marble stairs the princess Sarah Linda floated like a cloud. The duke's eye gleamed like crystal. The minstrel gazed in wonder. The princess Saralinda was tall, with Frisius in her dark hair, and she wore serenity brightly like a rainbow. It was not easy to tell her mouth from her nose, or her brow from the white lilac. Her voice was faraway music, and her eyes were candles burning on the tranquil night. She moved across the room like wind on violets, in violets, and her laughter sparkled on the air, which from her presence gained a faint and undreamed fragrance. The prince was frozen by her beauty, but not cold, and the duke, who was cold but not frozen, held up the palms of his gloves as if she were a fire at which to warm his hands. The minstrel saw the blood come warmly to the lame man's cheeks. This thing of rags and tags and tatters will play our little game, he told his niece, his voice like iron on velvet. I wish him well. The princess said. The minstrel broke his bonds and took her hand in his, but it was slashed away by a swift cane of the duke. Take him to his dungeon now, he said. He stared coldly at the minstrel through his monocle. You'll find the most amusing bats and spiders there. I wish him well, the princess said again, and the varlets took the minstrel to his dungeon. When the great iron door of the dungeon clanked behind the minstrel, he found himself alone in blackness, a spider swinging on a strand of web swung back and forth. A zickering of bats was echoed by the walls. The minstrel took a step, avoiding snakes, and something squirmed. "'Take care,' the Gallic said. "'You're on my foot.' "'Why are you here?' the minstrel cried. "'I forgot something. I forgot about the task the duke will set you.' The minstrel thought of swimming lakes too wide to swim, or turning liquids into stone, or finding boneless creatures made of bone. How came you here? he asked. And can you leave? I never know, the Gallic said. My mother was a witch, but rather mediocre in her way. When she tried to turn a thing to gold, it turned to clay, and when she changed her rivals into fish, all she ever got was mermaids. The minstrel's heart was insecure. My... hello... <clears throat> my father was a wizard, said his friend, who often cast his spells upon himself when he was at his cups. Strike a light or light a lantern, something, has, something I have hold of has no head. The minstrel shuddered. The task, he said. You came to tell me. I did? Oh, yes. My father lacked the power of concentration, and that is bad for monks and priests and worse for wizards. Listen. 
tell the Duke that you will hunt the boar, or travel thrice around the moon, or turn November into June, implore him not to send you out to find a thousand jewels. And then? And then he'll send you out to find a thousand jewels. But I'm poor, the minstrel cried. Oh, come, come, the Gallic said. You're Zorn of Zorna. I had it from a traveler I met. It came to him as he was leaving town. Your father's casks and coffers shine with rubies and with sapphires. My father lives in Zorna, said the prince, and it would take me nine and ninety days, three and thirty days to go, three and thirty days to come back here. That's six and sixty. Well, it always takes my father three and thirty days to make a decision, said the prince. In spells and labors, a certain time is always set, and I might be at sea when mine expires. That's another problem for another day, Legalic said. Time is for dragonflies and angels. The former live too little, and the latter live too long. Zorn of Zorna thought a while and said, The task seems strange and simple. There are no jewels, Legalic said, within the reach and ranges of this island except the gems here in this castle. The duke knows not that you are Zorn of Zorna. He thinks you are a minstrel without a penny or a moonstone. He's fond of jewels. You've seen them on his gloves. The prince stepped on a turtle. The duke has spies, he said, who may know who I am. The Gallic sighed. That may be wrong, he said, but we must risk and try it. The prince sighed in his turn. I wish you could be sure. I wish I could, the Gallic said. My mother was born, I regret to say, only partly in a call. I've saved a score of princes in my time. I cannot save them all. Something that would have been purple, if it had been the light of day to see it by, scuttled across the floor. The duke might give me only... Hmm, sorry. The duke might only give me only thirty days or forty-two to find a thousand gems and jewels, said Zorn of Zorna. Why should he give me ninety-nine? Well, the way I figure it, the Gallic said, is this. The longer the labor lasts, the longer lasts his gloating. He loves to gloat, you know. The prince sat down beside a toad. My father may have lost his jewels, he said, or given them away. I thought of that, the Gallic said, but I have other plans than one. Right now we have to sleep. They found a corner without creatures and slept until the town clock struck at midnight hour. Chains clanked and rattled, and the great iron door began to move. The Duke has sent for you again, the Gallic said. Be careful what you say and what you do. The great iron door began to open slowly. When shall I see you next? Zorn whispered. There was no answer. The prince groped around in the dark and felt a thing very like a cat and touched the thing without a head, but he could not find the Gallic's. The great iron door was opened wide now, and the dungeon filled with lantern light. The Duke commands your presence, growled the guard. What was that? Uh, what was what? I know not, said the guard. I thought I heard the sound of someone laughing. Is the Duke afraid of laughter? asked the prince. The Duke is not afraid of anything. Not even, said the guard. The total. The total? The total. What's a total? The lock, a lock in the guard's hair turned white and his teeth began to chatter. The total looks like a blob of glup, he said. It makes a sound like rabbits screaming and smells of old, unopened rooms. It's waiting for the duke to fail in some endeavor, such as setting you a task that you can do. And if he sets me one and I succeed, the prince inquired. The blob will glup him, said the guard. It's an agent of the devil sent to punish evildoers for having done less evil than they should. And I talk too much. Come on. The Duke is waiting.